Lenny, our topic today is revision stapedectomy. We've already discussed the topic of selection for revision, so let's talk a little bit about revisions themselves. Our first pearl is do not do a revision in less, to, in less than two or three months. In the earlier days of stapedectomy, it was very popular that if the patient was dizzy or that would use tuning forks and weren't happy with the tuning forks, the patient wasn't hearing well, that early revisions were in order. And that was especially in the days of, of gel foam, I think. Uh, but there were so many revisions early on. I myself did many revisions early on because that was, that was the thing to do. And I don't remember one case, I really don't, that I ever revised in the first month or two months that I was able to help. First of all, it looks like a jungle in there. You cannot tell any anatomy. The, the, the place is just a mess. The middle ear is just a mess. In the first two to three months, there is no reason to revise. I don't care whether the patient is dizzy or not hearing. Uh, there's, just, there's just no reason to do it. And you're not going to help them by going in. So stay out of the ear. We know that. Uh, our indications, I'm going to repeat a little bit. Uh, you should have at least a 20 to 25 decibel air bone gap. The patient's discrimination must be at least 75% if they have a moderate loss. You're not going to get anywhere revising an ear, you know, where you've got a 25 decibel air bone gap and a 70 decibel loss and, and a 40% discrimination. You're not going to help that patient. Also, your tuning forks must, must make sense. Either you need a negative Rene or at least a Weber that lateralizes to the ear you're going to be doing. The first thing we look at, or that I have looked at for years when I go into a revision ear, is whether or not I have to curette. That tells me how good the surgeon was who preceded me. If I've got to do any amount of curetting that's that of importance, then I know that the, I'm following an inexperienced surgeon. The second thing I do is to test the malleus, and I test the malleus every time with the same blunt, strong instrument. I lean it against the malleus, and if there's, as we know, if the malleus slightly moves or moderately moves or is almost fixed, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to get a good result. Or that is, the malleus is not the problem. It's only the totally fixed malleus where you can lean against it and it doesn't move. That's the only one that we're concerned about. Let's discuss a, a, an old topic and a short one, and that's revision of the posterior cruise technique. As you can see by the diagram, uh, the surgery that was done was where the patient had an anterior focus of disease. The surgeon would separate the anterior from the posterior portion of the foot plate, leave the anterior portion alone, and then slide the posterior cruise around to the posterior part of the foot plate. Jack Huff was a master at it, and he did a great job, but I don't think many people could reproduce his results. And I revised a lot of this technique uh, earlier in my career, and it's the, the simplest revision there is, because all I would do would be to take off that superstructure of the stapes, uh, put a, a vein graft down, you know, if the foot plate was moving, if not, remove that portion, that posterior portion of the foot plate, and then put down a vein graft, and a piston prosthesis, and uh, the, it's easy to get a good result. It's a simple revision to do. The piston prosthesis uh, presents, like every prosthesis, certain problems. I think the main problem is caused by the uh, retraction of the tympanic membrane in its posterior uh, superior segment, or a thin, where we have a thin uh, tympanic membrane to begin with. And there we can get an erosion, you know, of the prosthesis right through, can come out right out the drum. I've had a lot of them do that, because that drum just retracts down and, of course, pushes the prosthesis up through. And there, of course, we deal with an eroded incus, and we talk about that in a, in a separate segment. Um, and of course, we must be prepared to repair the, the drum, uh, either with uh, perichondrium uh, or fascia, probably perichondrium, uh, so that we won't get that kind of retraction again. 
The next problem I'd like to discuss is uh, uh, ankylosis of the piston prosthesis to the incus. This is a problem that, that develops two, three, five, ten years after surgery. And they, the patient slowly develops a uh, conductive loss. And as you can see by the slide, what happens is there's an actual ankylosis of that prosthesis to the lenticular process. And the prosthesis is, is pushed out of the oval window area and onto the promontory or somewhere else. Um, we used to do all sorts of cuckoo things uh, to try to, to repair this because in some cases you just can't get that prosthesis off. And where we couldn't get it off, uh, uh, we would put down a, a Bailey prosthesis from that incus down to the foot plate. Uh, we would come up with all sorts of Rube Goldberg things. Now since the laser, it's easy, isn't it? because we simply laser off the prosthesis and we put a lippy prosthesis on as shown in the next slide. So this next slide shows the prosthesis lasered off of the incus and then the lippy prosthesis placed on. And this works out very well, doesn't it? Why don't you discuss uh, some of the wire problems? Bill, the Teflon wire prosthesis uh, has been used uh, a great deal over many years. It's an excellent prosthesis. However, the lenticular process and the distal process of the uh, incus are susceptible to uh, uh, loss of blood supply if this wire is too tight uh, in that area and it can lead to necrosis. Uh, so we have seen many cases where there is prosthesis malfunction along with incus necrosis because of the wire problem at the uh, distal long process of the incus. And on ex expiration, once we've verified that the malleus is intact and mobile, and sometimes we need to rotate the bed away in order to see that and also palpate the malleus, we will then inspect that critical area of the incus prosthesis junction. And if we verify that there is an erosion at that junction, we will try then to move the wire prosthesis aside. And the great advantage of doing this with a patient under local anesthesia with sedation is that we can monitor their dizziness. If they are dizzy on two or three attempts while we, while we do this, we will not pull it out. Rather, we will set it aside as demonstrated in this diagram. What you see here is that the wire has been taken off the distal long process of the incus. Uh, but the Teflon portion or the medial wire portion in the neomembrane has been left alone because it would be too dangerous to remove it if the patient has dizziness. So we push it aside. And what we can do in our uh, reconstruction is leave that prior prosthesis in and cut a slit in our new vein graft to accommodate it and place new vein graft down with a bucket handle prosthesis uh, if the incus and lenticular process are adequate. We can use the classic Robinson prosthesis if there's damage at the lenticular process or the distal long process. We'll use a modified lipia of various lengths. Of course, in many of our cases that uh, <coughs> dizziness is not a problem and the, the, pro the prosthesis is loose either at the incus end or at the oval window and it's simply a matter of removing it. Mm -hmm. And you're talking here about <laughs> where you better be careful removing it because it's still attached and you don't want to do a labyrinthectomy or a partial labyrinthectomy. And that's why we want to know if the patient is dizzy. What's the main thing we see in stapedotomy? Stapedotomy uh, made and created uh, with a diameter of approximately 0.6 millimeters uh, is becoming uh, more and more uh, popular, especially over the last 20 years, with concerns of side effects from total stapedectomy. However, uh, 
for us to assume that uh, a prosthesis can be placed in a very small stapedotomy opening and stay there for long term may not be always necessarily so. Uh, mechanically, as the prosthesis moves, it may just come out slightly or hit the very edge of a thickened foot plate, and the patient can have a subsequent conductive hearing loss. So, in our revisions, when we explore a, an ear and we see a prosthesis that's not moving well, uh, we take down uh, its connection uh, to the neomembrane area, and we often find a great deal of foot plate left, uh, and this prosthesis will not be in the neomembrane, but rather adjacent to it. So we will remove that um, and then proceed with a partial stapedectomy, uh, focusing on the posterior foot plate to remove it, setting down the vein graft and our prosthesis. Let's talk, talk about what you're going to find when you're looking for a fistula. I found a large number of large fistulae throughout my career. Uh, and I found a, a fair number of small fistulae. Uh, it's another advantage uh, with the patient awake because you can have them bear down. Now you got to be very careful when you make the call of fistula because you know there, there have been eras we've gone through where almost everybody had a fistula. Uh, the rapidly progressive sensory neural loss, uh, there have been different eras in my career where fistulae have become very, Im or were very important. They're not as important today. So, you know, if you look into an ear and you see fluid accumulating, it doesn't mean a thing. I mean, there's just a certain amount of tissue fluid that's going to accumulate. You've got to, to see fluid coming from one place and, you know, it's got to change the light reflex on your microscope. It has to do something dramatic for you to confirm a fistula. Once, once you find it, of course, the repair is easy. You cover it with a tissue graft. The interesting fistulae that we've had with the piston vein technique uh, is that they've all occurred in, in the same kind of patient. We have six of them on our computer. They were all in women. And if you can assume that women have smaller veins than men, it means that their vein graft was probably a smaller or thinner graft than you, than you would have gotten on the average man. And they all, they all occurred on descent. And they all occurred where the facial nerve was uncovered. Now we talk about removing the mucosa all around the foot plate area before we, before we put down our vein graft. And we do that to get two adhesive t uh, surfaces. Now before this before I came to the realization of what was happening, I didn't take the mucosa off some of the uh, 